Today on This Week in Space, we visit with Mike Hecht, Principal Investigator for NASA's MOXIE experiment to make oxygen on Mars. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 28, recorded September 9th, 2022. Breathing on Mars. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging. There's one place you can go where hiring is simple, ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter finds and matches the right candidates with your job. Try it free today at ZipRecruiter.com slash TWIS. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Breathing on Mars edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine. And I'm joined by the inimitable Tarek Malik, editor in chief at space.com. Tarek, it's good to have you back. Where you been? I'm I'm back. I'm back from outer space. I feel like uh, I feel like it's been it's been ages. You know, there there's been a whole new Big Bang and big what big big collapse since I've been on. So I'm glad to be kind of back in back in the chair, the Star Trek chair that you will not get despite the many <laughs> Artemis delays, uh, Rod. So uh, I did I am, win the bet, here. but. Okay. Well, I haven't won the bet yet, but if we roll into October, <laughs> we're going to have a conversation. And we had uh, Jeffrey Naka nibbling at your heels while you were gone, so it's a good thing you came back, or he might have just stuck around. That's right. So, Jeff's a great um, guy. Great guy. Yeah. Right, did a good <laughs> job. So today we're going to talk with Mike Hecht, who's with us. Mike is the Associate Director of Research Management at MIT's Haystack Observatory and the Principal Investigator for NASA's incredible MOXIE experiment, which is what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Hi, Mike, and thanks for joining us. Hey, Ron, I'm glad to be here, and thank you for helping us uh, spread the word. Oh, it's it's a pleasure, and this is our third interview, I think. So I met you in 2016, I believe, at at JPL, and you were kind enough for a guy you had never seen before to give me a tour of your lab and show me your, your, your MOXIE demonstrator, and then I interviewed you for an Ad Astra article about a year ago, I think, which uh, we we got a lot of good feedback on, and, and now we're back to do more, and this won't be the end of it. So I appreciate you coming on. So, But before we embark on our journey to Mars, let's stroll through a couple of Mars dad jokes. Oh, Flash! I, I can't wait. Scientists <laughs> have discovered a planet populated entirely by robots. They call it Mars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for that sympathetic laugh, Derek. Okay, <laughs> this one's better. I... But it's funny because it's true. Well, it is true, but uh, this one's better. I hear they're making Mars astronauts shave their heads. That way they can baldly go where no one has gone before. (laughs) No, I think it's great. Where's the... Oh, crickets. Crickets. Ants not liking that one. Everybody's a cricket. It's good enough enough for, uh, for Captain Picard. It's good enough for me, is all I'm saying. So... Speaking of Picard, I think we discussed this in our sci-fi episode. I don't want to divert us too much, but anybody watching Picard? Well, I am. Everyone knows this. This is not, this is public knowledge. So, so okay, well, you don't have to act like it's a crime or something. But, well, <laughs> you know, I love Patrick Stewart. Worked with Patrick Stewart back in the 90s. And, you know, every time he came out on the set, nothing against the other actors, but they kind of fade in the background because here came Shakespeare, right? But I have to say, on Picard, you know, I was kind of hanging with the show, and then John Delancey came on the set, and I thought, you know, these guys are almost the same age, but it kind of shows differently. It wears differently on them, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So I don't know. It's just one of those moments that I had a, a terrific flash of mortality, and I thought, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to definitely be the oldest-looking guy in the room when my time comes. <laughs> um, no. I was right, hoping so, you'd, you'd go with the uh, restaurant on Mars joke. Oh, I hear it, the food's great, but it has no atmosphere? Uh, not much atmosphere. That's a perfect lead into what we're <laughs> going to talk about. You know, I, I looked at it, but we've used it, I think, twice or three times already um, about the moon. So, yeah, we were, we were kind of stuck. <laughs> and then all the other, I swear, every other Mars joke was curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> and uh, that's that's a good one if you work it up, you know, as a shaggy dog story, but just on its own, it's not okay. All right, so let's uh, get through some headlines real quick. <laughs> Yes. Hey, yes, Artemis update. <laughs> SLS. NASA says they will attempt to fix the hydrogen leak. And Tark, step in any time if, if I'm out of date here because you're following as close than I am. It will attempt to fix the 
hydrogen leak, the famed hydrogen leak, that stopped the second launch attempt with the rocket sitting on the launch pad instead of rolling it back to the VAB, or Vehicle Assembly Building. And if successful, this would allow the move attempt to launch as early as September 23rd. And not rolling the rocket back to the VAB is good for a couple of reasons. It's a quicker fix, and you also don't want to roll that thing back and forth any more than you have to because it's a rattly ride down that that uh, road covered with crushed river rock. But the success of this depends on a couple of factors. The big one that's staring us in the face is they've got to get a waiver from the Air Force, who uh, is responsible for range safety, for the flight termination system, which are the explosives installed in the rocket that, that, well, there's no other way to say it. They blow it up if it goes off course. And those are powered by batteries, and those batteries are certified for 20 days. So NASA already got a waiver to take it up to 25 days, but I guess they're going to need another one. Time's about up. So if the Air Force denies that, they've got to return to the VAB because for whatever reason, you have to be in the VAB to check those batteries and possibly service them. So do you have any updates on that? Well, yeah. So so as, as we're recording this, I, I just got out of a press conference uh, yesterday with uh, with NASA. And, you know, it, it, it really is kind of a sense of a lot of things have to go right. You know, September 23rd is a nice, juicy target for, for this 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 third this yeah. third time to to uh, to try to launch the, the mission but uh, it's it's far from a lock now they want to keep it at the pad because uh, the and I was there for both of these launch attempts by the way <laughs> it was of course it was very you frustrating were. Uh, of course and and uh, they want to keep it at the pad because only there can they replace the leak uh, or replace the seals that, that they think caused the leak and also then fuel it back up and test those leaks to see right. if they if they worked. Otherwise, if they you know they could easily fix it back in the VAB, but they wouldn't be able to fuel it at the pressures that it would need uh, to, to test if they were good. They'd have to roll back or out Or the again. temperatures, right, because exactly. they can only Exa run cryogenic fuels at the pad, right? Exa exactly, exactly. And so, so that saves them some time because they want to do yet another fueling test to make sure that that, 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 that uh, fix works. So that's two things. You've got to fix the leak, and then you've got to fuel the, the rocket and hope that nothing else goes wrong while you're doing that uh, to check if your, if your leak fix worked. So if if all things like not considered everything else just how, how do I say that if that was all there was then they'd be good to go right if they were able to get through that but then there is this flight termination issue that you mentioned and that is something that seems like it's not really that much of a lock in fact it, it sounded as if uh, when NASA was talking to us this week that they were speaking a bit out of school when they were saying, oh, we have to go back to the Space Force and ask them if it's all right to get an extension. They've, they had a 20-day a deadline in, in between when they got the rocket to the pad and left the VAB and they were supposed to launch where they would have to recheck the batteries on some of, some of the flight termination system. Now, the batteries are on the core stage. That's the big orange part of the booster. And they're bigger than the ones on, on different parts of the rocket. NASA, in order to even try for their second attempt on the third, they got an extension to go to 25 days. So that's great. That that extension is now expired, which means that if uh, Space Force doesn't, you know, relax their restrictions on how often they have to test these batteries, they got to go off the pad anyway. And if they do that, it's weeks of delay. It takes uh, days to run up. Uh, it takes a full day to get back. Then they have to safe everything down again. And like you mentioned, it's not that easy on the rocket. 32 stories this rocket stands, 322 feet. Um, it doesn't have a lot of roll rollbacks and rollouts in it before they start to worry about the hardware. But we saw that with the shuttle. They rolled them back and forth uh, a, a lot. This is a lot bigger and I mean, it's a brand new vehicle. They have to learn everything from it. But all that stuff has to go right for them to be able to still try this this uh, this month. And as we're as we're recording this, and it's really not a lock that, that that's going to happen. So, well, and and I just want to add, if you look back at the history of new vehicles, so whether it's the Saturn V or the shuttle, they all had a lot of delays. And in fact, if you go back to Apollo Four, which was in the '60s, I think that was delayed by five or six months for a lot of reasons. And obviously we've learned a lot about building rockets since then, and this is shuttle legacy hardware. So there's some built-in knowledge there, but it is a new system and uh, there, there's gonna be challenges. One of the things I thought a very sad irony is that you know, on that first launch attempt, they thought they weren't getting the engine chilled down, turned out to be a bad sensor, which as far as I know, the fix was, okay, let's ignore it and look at other factors. So they probably could have launched that day. And then on the second yeah. launch attempt, they get that much bigger hydrogen leak apparently because of a 
of an operator error that uh, that overpressured the quick disconnect line that does the the um, commutes the hydrogen back and forth from the main tank. So a little frustrating, but you know there were, there shouldn't be a rush. I, I know that people want to see it, and I know that NASA wants wants it to be seen, and they're attending to their their outreach efforts more than they did in the past in the '60s. But you know you got to take your time and get it right because these rockets and, are expensive. And we should we sh I should point out that NASA was very quick to say that while while the the while there was an overpressure event in this fuel line before the big leak that they could not stop, they haven't they haven't found conclusively that that was the issue, even though it was a manual command, which means someone in launch control flipped the switch. They said that they added that manual command in between the first launch attempt and the second launch attempt, so it was a new thing, and that that they, NASA's management is kind of taking it on the chin for that one, saying that it was actually, you know, they, they didn't give the, the the flight controllers enough time practicing with these new manual mm. uh, processes. So I just wanted to point that out because there's a lot of fingers trying to be pointed at, like, who was that person that pushed the button? Uh, Jim Free, NASA's Associate Administrator for uh, Exploration and Development Systems, did say that it, it, it's everyone is in management is at fault for that, for that, and it's as if they all pushed their, their, the, put their finger on the button, I believe is what he said, so... Well, and, and you know, people are going to complain about this no matter how it goes because it's SLS and it's expensive. But it is the moon rocket we've got, and as we've discussed before, it's great that we've got commercial partners, and we'll probably never do another cost plus contract of this magnitude again with NASA. But at the same time, you know, we don't have proof positive that these other systems are going to work anytime in the near future. And by other systems, I mean Starship and um, uh, the Blue Origin rocket. So. You know, let's 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 stay with it and and give them give them our best intentions. Okay, next story: mutants from space. New <laughs> research shows genetic mutations in blood drawn from astronauts, which has been stored for the past twenty years, who had flown into space. It's a small study; it's about fourteen or fifteen people, but the mutations appear to affect stem cells that create new blood, which is concerning. Um, so even over, over short mission durations, like 12 days, which was what surprised me, I thought, oh, well, this is probably if you're up there for a year. But no, even for over the short term, this appears to be an effect. And while the level of mutations was not high enough to cause serious disease, it's just one more way that space flight affects the body negatively, along with bone loss and possible cognitive degeneration and deformation of the eyes and radiation effects and all that. So... One more thing we got to overcome before we send our frail little meatbag bodies up into space. Yeah, this is an interesting one. This came from Unilad, but I'll point out that they did actually cite space.com for the source for this story. Um, but, uh, oh, thank you. But yeah, thank they, you for <laughs> they, 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 uh, um, uh, the, the scientists, they used samples of blood from 14 astronauts over 20 years, like you mentioned. And it just it's, a, it's another one of those examples of how, uh, how spaceflight is affecting the human body over not just like six months of a mission for astronauts on the space station, which we know already has deleterious effects on 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 the body, on your muscles, on your bones, uh, on your immune system too. Uh, but now yeah, now yeah. they're finding these these DNA switches. You know, and NASA actually had a really great uh, chance to really look at this in detail just a few years ago, back in the 2015 or so time frame when they sent Scott Kelly and uh, to the astronaut twin to the space station while his twin brother, also a NASA astronaut at the time, uh, uh, or a previous NASA astronaut, uh, Mark Kelly, uh, stayed stayed back on Earth. And they, they've got a lot more insight now on those genetic changes uh, because of experiments like this that run over over time. And so it's just kind of one more thing to, to look at now. Can they create some sort of like DNA fix for a lot of these changes, that's a big question. You know, we've got like there's new different uh, research in in CRISPR and other genetic technology that they're going to probably look at, but it's still really, really early to start worrying about fixing uh, mutations with other kinds of mutations. I think that's that's still science fiction stuff for this. So, I think it's going to be easier in the long run to just transplant our brains into little robots like your favorite. <laughs> what was his name? Twicky in Flash Gordon. That that awful. Little oh, robot the, with the speech impediment. <laughs> okay, Buck. Uh, you know, we just put our brains in there, and they they handle the mission for us. Okay, we're wasting time here. Um, final comment, and and I'd like to hand this off to you on the passing of the Queen. A very sad day. 
Yeah, it, it was a it was a very sad sad week, uh, especially for you know the space.com by the way is owned by by Future, uh, a, a UK company. So, um, uh, you know the, the Queen Elizabeth II did pass away on on September eighth, and while this isn't uh, a direct space story, it is something that has resonated through. Uh, the space industry, NASA, and many other space a- agencies around the world all uh, sent uh, con- condolences and remembrances. And I should point out that even Buzz Aldrin, uh, you know, mentioned about, uh, you know, just the, the, the loss. He said uh, yesterday, he said, God bless Queen Elizabeth, a gracious leader, lady, and our host on return from the moon. Uh, the, he oh. and his Apollo 11 crewmates met uh, with the queen and uh, um, and uh, and her husband uh, after they came back from from Apollo 11, uh, and so there was um, and there was a wide reach when it comes to space exploration and and the monarchy, and she was a, a big part of that. So I just thought we should at least mention that right now because it, it is sure. a a global event and it is one that has touched NASA and astronauts from the UK. I'm sure. Well, I appreciate that and. We'll be back to talk to Mike Moxie Hecht after this short message, so stay with us. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, especially right now when you have so much on your plate. Luckily, there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter.com slash TWIS. You know, finding qualified candidates for your business could be a real bear. Endless resumes and dead-end interviews proliferate. Why not make it easy on yourself? With ZipRecruiter, you can get qualified candidates on the first day and know that you'll be interviewing people whose qualifications meet your needs. When I was working in television in the dark old days, we had an endless need for new hires, and the process was tiresome, and half the people who walked through my door were not even vaguely what I was looking for. It took me forever to find the right folks, but with ZipRecruiter, if I had had it, those problems would have been a thing of the past. You'll have plenty of good people and be able to choose the best of the best in short order. ZipRecruiter does the work for you. Its powerful technology finds and matches the right candidates with your job. You can easily review recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. In fact, four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within that first day. ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site based on G2 satisfaction ratings as of January 1st, 2022. And right now, to try ZipRecruiter for free, my listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TWIS. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TWIS. ZipRecruiter.com slash TWIS. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And we're back. So, Mike, so glad you could join us today. Really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And you have a pretty amazing resume over the past decade plus. Can you just give us uh, your, 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 your thumbnail of what you've done and what you're up to today and how you got there? Yeah, Rod, it's, a, um, it's almost a funny story. I, about a dec- a decade plus ago, I left JPL. I had been at JPL for 30 years. I had had the privilege to be the principal investigator on an instrument on the Mars Phoenix mission that that explored Mars soil, and it was very exciting. Loved JPL, but you know I'm a native of the Boston area. Family's here, and and um, my family. We reached the point where we said it's time to go home, and I'm going to have to give up all this Mars stuff. I'm sure, and find another gig in the Boston area, and and I was delighted to find this position at the Haystack Observatory. It was a very good match, but it meant kind of dredging up from my my, uh, distant past the couple of years I spent studying astrophysics with a a fellow by the name of Jeff Hoffman, by the way, who subsequently became an astronaut and is now my partner in MOXIE. But that was about the only thing I knew about radio astronomy when I came to the Haystack Haystack Observatory, which is a radio (laughs) science facility. And I said, all right, new adventure in my life. I'll learn something new and, you know, 59 years old, all right, I can slow down a little. And uh, instead, this opportunity came along from, you know, from colleagues, uh, I heard first at, at JPL saying, hey, we've got some partners that we think would make a great team to propose to this mission. So on the one hand, I was getting hip deep in the Event Horizon Telescope at Haystack, which is you know, pretty darn exciting project, taking images of black holes. And at the same time, this, this new Mars opportunity landed, you know, landed in my lap. And I suddenly had these, you know, wonderful two, uh, you know, two wonderful global collaborations going on with cutting edge science. 
you know, at a time where I thought, as I said, I was going to be kind of coasting, coasting down to, you know, to, to, toward retirement at some point. So it's been an amazing 10, 11, 12 years, and it's still going strong. Well, we're not going to let you retire because you're working on really cool stuff. So let's jump into Moxie. This is an experiment to produce small quantities of oxygen for the Martian atmosphere, as I hope our listeners know. And we, we, from should, we, should, to, we should say that we should say the name yeah. of the experiment. What because Mo, Moxie is fun to say, Moxie, Moxie, Moxie. It, but it actually means it something, right? Right, Mike? Can you okay? Go what, ahead. What does Take it actually it mean? Oh, it sure does. It's the Mars Oxygen <laughs> ISRU experiment. It's got an acronym embedded in it. You know, I tried to be a connoisseur of acronyms, and you never embed another one. But, <laughs> but there was an earlier version of, of some, a, a group that tried to do this back on what was supposed to be the 2001 Mars Surveyor Lander. The mission was canceled. They had an instrument on it called the Mars ISPP, which is what they called ISRU then, Mars ISPP Experiment uh, uh, Precursor, Precursor, MIP. And it never flew. Uh, some of the, the MIP people are actually on our MOXIE team, and it was the trailblazer. It, it showed that, yeah, you could build something to do this. So when I came up with the name for MOXIE, I said, okay, I, I, I'll... I'll inject an acronym, ISRU, as kind of an homage to the old MIP experiment. But the key is, what is ISRU? What is ISRU? That's the key. I ISRU about that. Stands, <laughs> yeah, stands for In-Situ Resource Utilization, which is a mouthful. Uh, we like to say it means living off the land, but LOL was taken as an acronym, so we needed <laughs> something else. Uh, <laughs> So ISRU, in situ means in the place. So it means you use resources you find in the place. Um, and, and in this case, I mean, there's some trivial examples of that. You, you know, when you use a parachute on Mars, yeah, you're kind of doing ISRU because you're using the air to break. But really what people focus on is when you can find a native resource and transform it into something useful. Okay, so what we're doing in this case, uh, it really, which is really the first real example of ISRU that has ever been done on another planetary body, whether it's the moon or Mars. Uh, this is the first instance. We're taking carbon dioxide from the very thin atmosphere and we're making oxygen. We're making oxygen, I like to say, out of thin air. Um, very thin, <laughs> extremely thin air. So I want a rim shot for that. I like that. Is, is, yeah, that's right. <laughs> now, half the problem is drawing in enough of this thin air to actually make something, make something with. How, how tricky, and Rod, forgive me for, for jumping in, but how, when I was in chemistry class in high school, I remember that we got a little test tube of water and we ran a current through it and we made oxygen and hydrogen out of that. And we, you know, it was really fun. We got to like ignite the hydrogen, made a big, big flash, uh, or the oxygen, pardon me. And, and, and it was great. And that's what, when it comes to breaking up one thing into oxygen that's what i think about uh when i first heard about moxie but but is it is that what it looks like it's a box of an instrument on the perseverance rover but but how do, how do you actually i mean suck in the air and separate it all out and then know what you got afterward exactly yeah no that's yeah you were doing electrolysis which is what we're doing so in that sense the chemistry is very similar most electrolysis systems uh, or even electrochemical systems use some kind of a membrane to separate out a particular type of ion. You know, if it's a pH meter, if it's a pH meter, that's a kind of electrolysis system that is it is drawing hydrogen, hydro, so-called hydronium, hydro, hydrogen ions across a you know plastic, a polymer membrane. That's how these things work. Oxygen is a lot tougher, and the best way people have found to move ox to separate out oxygen in an electrolysis experiment is to use a ceramic membrane heated to very high temperatures, 800 degrees centigrade. I mean, that, that's really hot, but it works extremely well. And then you can just, you can put a voltage across that membrane and draw the oxygen ions through once you create them. The other half of the problem is how are you going to get the oxygen ions off the carbon dioxide molecule and just get one of them off? You don't want to take two off because then you leave behind carbon and that makes a mess and ruins your device. So you want to take each carbon dioxide molecule, pull off one oxygen atom, leave behind the carbon monoxide, the stuff you don't want in your basement, but you know you can release it outdoors, it does no <laughs> harm. 
That's the other thing we make. We make oxygen, carbon monoxide. If we were doing this experiment on Earth, the irony is we would throw away the oxygen because we've got plenty <laughs> of that, and we would use the carbon monoxide to make, say, a synthetic fuel. So we've adapted things that you know you kind of do on Earth, but we use them in a very different way from Mars. So as I recall from talking to you, Moxie, to, to achieve this, it, it's kind of a heroic effort. It's very power hungry. You need a lot of power, I guess, mainly for the heater, right? Well, not really. I mean, it, it, the, the Moxie system we envision in the future will use something like 90% of the power just pulling apart those carbon dioxide molecules. And you can't get around that. I don't care if you use plasmas or lasers or whatever technique. It takes a certain amount of energy to tear an oxygen ion off of a CO2 molecule. And we hope and expect in the next generation system that that's where most of the energy goes. If you think about the heat, yeah, you heat something up to 800 degrees C, but if you put it in a perfect oven, you know, in a, in a perfect insulated oven, once it's hot, it'll stay hot forever. So that should not be a, a, a draw on power unless you've got heat leaking out and then you've got to put more heat in to keep it hot. So in our case, since it's very small, yeah, more heat leaks out than we would like. Um, but for our, for our version of MOXIE on Mars, most of the power is actually going to that compressor that's drawing in the carbon dioxide. Ah, we, okay. now know how to, we now know how to do that more efficiently. We didn't at the time we, we, we built it. Because well, you know, that's I, I remember. No, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I just 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 say I remember talking to you before. You do have to sort of shut down most of the other things going on with the rover to do this, right? Well, that's absolutely to right. Do these we, runs. We, um, yeah, when when it's a moxie day, everybody goes to the beach. I mean, we don't. <laughs> well, I was going to ask we you have to negotiate with the team, can. right? Yeah. Well, we do. We do. And, you know, we, we don't run more than once every month or once every couple of months. Um, these days, once the Perseverance mission went on, you know, it's multi-day, they call them SOLs, the multi-SOL planning kind of schedule so that people, you know, the staff can get the weekends off, that sort of thing. Every weekend we plan, you know, three days at a time. It's tougher and it's tough to plan those three days when you don't know what's going to happen on the first or second one. So that turns out to be a useful time when we want to run Moxie to, to just tag it on to one of those multi-day plans um, when, you know, when, when it would be, you know, they'd be looking for things to do, um, you know, not knowing, say, exactly where the rover will end up if it's driving after one or two days. So we find places to fit in Moxie where it doesn't get in the way. Well, I, I was just reading. Uh, I was reading space.com actually <laughs> last week that mentioned that you've of course you've you're passed right. this uh, <laughs> your seventh your seventh run is that right uh, so far uh, with Moxie <laughs> well, or is it more than that? <laughs> we pub we the, the first round of publications of scientific publications you know in, in journals is just coming out now for the Perseverance mission. The Moxie publication is one of those. It came out in Science Advances last week. And I got a lot of media coverage, which was which was really satisfying. Uh, but that was on the first year of Moxie. The first time we ran was February, you know, of 2021. So it's already way outdated. So we've done, we've done 11 <laughs> runs now. We've done 11. Wow. And the last one we made 10.4 grams an hour, which, it, on the scheme of things, is not a huge amount of oxygen, but. Our requirement, you know, when we built the instrument, we required it under Mars conditions to do six grams an hour with a goal of doing eight, and we just did over 10. So um, we're, we're, we're learning. We're learning how to do this better. We're taking a few more risks as we go along. So the, well, and, the and you, Oh, you, go ahead. You, I was just going to say, you Mars guys are such chronic overachievers, right? I mean, every mission <laughs> that goes up lasts longer than, than the minimum and, and usually longer than what's expected. Now you're creating more oxygen than, than advertised. And a after you've done that, I assume you release it to the atmosphere and then, and then stand down for your next run when you do it, right? Yeah, that's, we do catch and release all the time. We just keep enough <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> we slow it down enough so we can measure it as it goes by. So we can measure the pressure and how pure it is, that sort of thing. So you don't you don't like package your oxygen and mount it on the wall like a fishing trophy. <laughs> to, to I, when we built it, I wanted to put one of those. You know, the guys you see in front of the auto parts stores that 
they inflate and raise up their hands. That's, that was my my dream, but you know, NASA I'll didn't bet. like the idea. So there we go. <laughs> well, tell me about the atmosphere of Mars. You've mentioned okay, it's thin, right? And and I, I assume from everything I've, I've the reason that we don't have astronauts walking around there is because you know we can't survive on the surface. Uh, and I was reading it's like 96% carbon dioxide, which doesn't sound like fun to breathe. But um, is, is, is there a place on Earth where the atmosphere is comparable, like Everest or something like that, that you're, 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 you've, you've had for a baseline? Or, or is it really just trying to get the most oxygen that you can from the stuff that's there now? Uh, yes, there, on Earth, the equivalent in terms of the thickness, of the, the thinness of the atmosphere is what you would find at 100,000 feet. You're not going to find oh. mountains up there, but you are going to get, you know, these, these high-pressure balloons do go up to, a, do go up to about 100,000 feet. I was involved in, an ex, in a project at, at JPL to, to send some instruments up on a high-pressure balloon as a way of, of sort of qualifying them of, uh, for working on Mars. And, and there have been, there was somebody who went up in one of those balloons and parachuted down and survived those pressures. That would be like being an astronaut on Mars. The difference, though, is that on Earth, if you look at that atmosphere at 100,000 feet, it's still nitrogen and oxygen, just like it is down here. There's just less of it. And, you know, the oxygen is coming from, from originally carbon dioxide that has been um, you know, reduced by plants to create oxygen. Trees, plankton, all sorts of things. And um, the fact that that doesn't, that there's CO2 only on Mars and very little oxygen tells you, is one way of telling you that there isn't a, you know, a, uh, a vibrant, flourishing plant community there busy turning CO2 into oxygen. Although for a long time we thought there might be. And the great wave too. of darkening from the 50s and all that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I assume you run it under a variety of conditions, at least as much as the conditions change where the rover is. When I interviewed you a few years ago, you said a quote which I loved, which I'm paraphrasing here, but you basically said, instruments like this are often doomed to succeed on Earth, which is another way of saying that testing on site, in this case on Mars, is, is critical because, as you mentioned earlier, we're kind of counting on this for the future. For, for human exploration with with larger versions of MOXIE. Can you go into some detail about that kind of testing? Yeah, I mean, I sure can. The, the, of course, that quote, I should, I should credit Jeff Hoffman for that. And, and okay. His, his years of being an astronaut, you know, he really learned the difference between uh, uh, testing things on Earth and, and testing things on Mars. And uh, uh, I had the same reaction you did when I heard this, you know, test beds are doomed to succeed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. What was the question again, Rod? <laughs> oh well, just so you know, the implication is you've got to test it there, right? You, mm -hmm. you could test it all day on Earth, but you know, on Mars with with less gravity and different temperature conditions and all that, as much as you might try to get it to fail on Earth, it may not. But what you don't want is your scaled up unit that that NASA is going to make someday or somebody's going to make and send up there to fail while your astronauts are hoping to either have that for breathing or for liquid oxygen to get back home. Well, that's right. And, and uh, you know, there are, there are an awful lot of things that we will have to fly to Mars for the first time when we bring astronauts. So you really need to pick and choose saying, what is so new, you know, so radically different from anything we've done before that we really need to subject it to a test in situ, you know, in the place, that it's not good enough the tests we would do in the laboratory aren't good enough. And MOXIE was at the top of that list and um, has all for a long time been on the top of that list for decades. There are a few things, both that have to be tested on Mars and that have to be learned about Mars, such as, you know, what's dangerous there? Is, there, is the soil toxic? That sort of thing. So there's always, you know, for, always been a short list, um, much of which has been checked off by now. And MOXIE was, was the big gap that a knowledge gap that, you know, can we do this or do we have to bring all the oxygen with us? So we tested it, you know, to, to death on Earth and we still found things that, um, as I said, we now know how to, you know, from experience, how to run um, the compressors a lot more efficiently. We learned a number of things we should do differently next time. You know, that said, everything worked splendidly, um, astonishingly. You know, if, if you... Um, 
You know, think about the first thing that happens when you turn something on on Mars. You haven't turned it on for, what, two and a half years? The last <laughs> time you ran it, right? And in between, it's been subjected to everything from Florida humidity to, you know, to launch, uh, to, to cruise and vacuum and landing. And, and then you turn it on again. Um, you know, I seem to have read rec- what you wrote recently about, about getting to Devon Island after a few years of being closed in the pandemic and hoping that the ATVs would start up. Okay, that's what we do when we it's, land something on Mars. It's the same thing. Will this still start up now that we've got it here? So even that first time that you turn it on is a nail biter. All right, well, everyone hold on to their helmets for a minute. Stop biting your nails and stand by one for this short message and we'll be right back. So what are the next steps for Moxie? How many more times do you run it and what what variables, if you have any you can control at this point, do you change? Okay, the, the plan from the program from Moxie on Mars has, there's been multiple aspects, but one key aspect has been the fact that Mars changes. Mars has weather. It's different sorts of weather than we have on Earth. You know, we don't have rainstorms or we don't even have windstorms like they showed in the Martian, you know, what the windstorm on Mars might knock over a lawn chair. But um, uh, it, what, one of the things that changes a lot is the actual density of the air. It changes a little on Earth. You know, the weather, the temperature gets a little hotter and colder. And we know from <laughs> those of us in New England know from deflate gate that, you know, how <laughs> temperature affects pressure inside a football, right? It's the same thing on a planet. But temperature doesn't change that much on Earth compared to how much it changes on Mars. And you hear on the weather, high pressure areas moving in or low pressure areas. And, and on Mars, the pressure changes by maybe 30% over the course of the year. So the density of the air, which is a combination of pressure and temperature, changes by as much as a factor of two from the, from the kind of the hottest time and the lowest pressure to the coldest time and the highest pressure of the year. And we wanted to run MOXIE in all those different conditions because the denser the air, the more CO2 we have to work with. So one of the one of the agendas that we were pursuing was just tracking those changes through the year and running daytime and nighttime in different times of day all through the seasons. And so we've we've done we've had the best of times and the worst of times and we're successful in both. <laughs> we haven't quite gotten through dust season yet, which of course makes a difference and uh, so one objective is just to sample all the way through that annual cycle. And a year on Mars is closer to two years on Earth. So that's one of the things we're doing. And then we come up with all these kind of diabolical experiments to learn more about what's inside that machine on Mars. Because, you know, when we, when we decide, oh, you know what, that we, we need, we really should have measured, right? We really should have measured the resistance of this wire because it matters. Uh, we can't just go up with a probe and measure it. So we have to come up with very clever, indirect ways to measure those things. So we do some of that too. We try out some new modes of operation um, that might run more efficiently and more safely. Uh, so we've got a bunch of just experiments, you know, diagnostic kind of experiments we do, interspersed with these runs that are designed to, you know, to test the extremes of environments. You know, I, I, I wanted to ask you to look at like the future Mike, about what this means. Because you mentioned, you know, this is an experiment where you didn't know if you would actually even be able to do this thing. It's a great thing that science fiction always writes about, about astronauts making their own air, their own rocket fuel that Rod uh, just mentioned earlier. What, and, and, and here you are outperforming your, your six gram goal with 10 grams of oxygen, and that's great. And congratulations to you and the team to, to kind of shatter those records. What will a, a, a base need? for astronauts on, let, let's say like a, on a, a sortie or if they're going to have a base, how much oxygen do they need to make? And, uh, and did you want to try to make liquid oxygen for fuel on this experiment? Or, uh, you know, because I, I would assume that's a whole other process that might need a whole different machine to make fuel versus oxygen to breathe. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of questions buried in there. So let me see. Oh, if yeah. I, if I, was, I can, I can never ask order. one. I'm you know, sorry. Yeah, nice job, Derek. <laughs> that's, that's <fine>. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but starting with your question about what the future looks like, because that's, I won't say that's a good question. That is the question. That's why we're mm. doing this. So let, let me 
start shortest term, you know, we send these first missions to Mars, our grandkids are ready to go to Mars in, you know, 20 years or 25 years, whatever it is, um, and what that's going to look like. You know, and this was first envisioned, I mean, this was envisioned back by Werner von Braun. It's an old, old idea. How do you get to Mars? Well, you get a chance to leave every 26 months. There are some funky orbits in between there, but basically the planets lined up, line up for the simple low energy, you know, short time uh, uh, transfer from Earth to Mars every 26 months. So instead of sending everything at once and hoping for the best, the idea has long been you take one opportunity and send the infrastructure, you send the base, you pre-deploy everything, and then you wait 26 months and you send the crew and hopefully land them in the same place, or you've got a great fiction, a science fiction story or a, or a disaster. <laughs> uh, oh, no. <laughs> I think Jeff Landis did that one once. Um, but anyway, you do that, and so the question is, what do you send in advance? Well, obviously a habitat, a place to live. Um, obviously a, a rocket that you know the astronauts can use to leave when they're done. Um, vehicles, you know, ro uh, rovers, maybe pressurized, maybe not. And the big thing you would send is a power plant. That's huge. And that's a big power plant. That would be, they would, that crew of four to six will need, you know, 25 or 30 kilowatts of power. NASA's working on that. But just for comparison's sake, the rover has about 100 watts. Okay, and we're talking 25,000 to 30,000 watts. I mean, 100, the rover is like running off a light bulb, you know, it, it's nothing. <laughs> And that's why Moxie makes so little oxygen, not because we're taking baby steps. Honestly, I would have rather have preferred, much preferred to have sent a full-size Moxie to Mars on Perseverance, but we only had 100 watts to, to deal with, uh, to work with. So th the idea is once that power plant is there, now it's just gotta sit there for 26 months until the astronauts arrive. You might as well use it for something. Okay, so everything is sized to that idea. How can we use that power plant, the 25 to 30 kilowatts, to help prepare for the astronauts' arrival? And so it turns out if we simply scale up the production of MOXIE, you know, with these assumptions about how we make it more efficient, the goal would be we would have to make two to three kilograms of oxygen an hour, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 grams an hour. We've already got you know, the, the core of the system that can do that, by the way. Um, and we have to do that for about a year, which gives us plenty of time after we land to kind of turn everything on, make oxygen, fill up a tank with oxygen, and then tell the crew, you know, waiting on Earth before their launch, hey, everything's ready for you. You know, that mm -hmm. tank of oxygen is waiting for you, so you will be able to go home once you launch. And then, you know, of course, we could keep making more while they're on their way to Mars, but, but, but we know we have enough to launch. So that's question one. What's the real near term look like? But that's oxygen, okay? You can't launch a rocket with oxygen. You launch a rocket with fuel. You, you feed your bodies with fuel. It's all the same idea, but you need the oxygen to burn the fuel. So why are we focusing on oxygen? Well, it turns out, we never think about this on Earth, but the oxygen actually takes up a lot more space and weighs a lot more than the fuel that we're burning, whether we're talking about our cars or our bodies or our campfires or a rocket. The real big heavy thing that we're burning is not fuel, you know, it's oxygen. So send that first. That saves you like 25 to 30 tons of <laughs> oxygen that you would have to take for Earth. The astronauts will breathe to a couple of tons, okay? So you want to make that too, but heck, that you could bring and it wouldn't be a big burden. But mm -hmm. bringing 25 to 30, that's the big burden. So we worry about the rocket and more than the astronauts. Um, fuel, well, another seven tons in the short term, you bring it, but you mentioned a while ago, starting with water and splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen. Well, to make a good rocket fuel, a good rocket fuel, you need hydrogen. You can use our carbon monoxide from MOXIE as a rocket fuel, but it's not a good one. Mm -hmm. It has a low, what they call ISP. Um, uh, so, um, you know, so you'd have to use huge tanks of CO or do something else. But with hydrogen, we can make methane. Why methane? Well, you could use hydrogen as a fuel, but we all see the problems that Artemis is having with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough fuel to work with. 
I mean, that's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. It's a tough fuel to work with because the, the little buggers, you know, kind of sneak through any, those, any aperture and leak out. They, right? That's what they say. Those, those, those hydrogen atoms are so tiny, <laughs> they get out of that's everything. Right. So. Exactly right. So methane is a good stable fuel to work with. That's what people think about. It's, it's a carbon atom, you know, surrounded by a bunch of hydrogen atoms. So the idea is to make methane. Well, we've got the carbon in the CO2 and we've got the hydrogen if you can find the water. So at some point, if we want to have a self-sustaining presence on Mars, this is kind of step two, you know, the, the next season of, of um, you know, of for all mankind, right? You want to have a self-sustaining self presence, uh, uh, you then have to go and find water and bring water back. And, and uh, uh, the, there are different ways to do it. You can go drilling for it. Personally, I think it's just lying there in permafrost. If you go up to, you know, 45 degrees, 50 degrees north, I would send a truck personally and fill it up and bring mm -hmm. it back. I think that's easier than, than, than mining, but maybe not as exciting for the robotics guys. I don't know. Um, but anyway, that's the next stage, right? You find that's a way the, to, to get water and then you have water the, and carbon dioxide and you can make anything you want. I was going to say, that's like the next season of ice truckers, uh, right? <laughs> on, on dis ice coming soon to Discovery yeah. Channel. So. <laughs> That's well, right. and interestingly, you know, not not to mm -hmm. jump back too much into history, but you mentioned von Braun, and of course, as, as young men, we all read Das Mars Project in one language or another. Yeah, and I always love you know reading about these enormous gliders that, of course, would have augured in instantly because there wasn't enough atmosphere to support their their glide. But the idea that you'd land the first one on the quote smooth ice on the pole, which was a big assumption. And then load all your guys in your Mars tractor and drive from the pole to the equator to land the rest of them. And, all, and of course, he was carrying all his fuel with him, so it doesn't apply exactly what you're talking about. But I just thought that was such an audacious plan. But so just, just hinging off of what you were just telling us, are there concrete plans to, to scale this unit up and, and move ahead? And will you be involved with that? There absolutely are concrete plans to scale it up. And of course, that's what Great. we want to do in the short term. Uh, there's a, our key partner is a company that's now called Oxion Energy, uh, back when they built this electrolysis system for us, you know, just the core of it, the, 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 the cells, these ceramic cells and all the special sauce that makes it work. Uh, they were called Ceramitech and, you know, companies do this. They're now called Oxion Energy and they have a contract from NASA. They have built, okay, we have a little stack of of 10 cells and the cells are, you know, maybe as, about as big as my computer mouse here. Um, and Oxion is now making cells that are, that are um, five times bigger in area and they stack up 60 of them instead of stacking up 10. So they take four of these, you know, big stacks and they put them together and they can make a kilogram uh, of oxygen an hour per, per, you know, per stack. So we already have, you know, we've already, out there testing the you know, this core element that actually turns the carbon dioxide to oxygen on a scale that we would that we would envision. Uh, we also there's also another another company, Air Squared, that makes the compressor that collects the carbon dioxide, and they're out there um, they're out there making large compressors to to work at lower pressure more efficiently and collect more CO2. So it's going on. That's good to hear. So, so I, the, I guess, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, ha I have a vision of you that's, that's horribly inaccurate and probably unfair, but standing on Mars with a cutlass and, and your incredible supply of liquid oxygen when SpaceX shows up <laughs> looking for a lot of, <laughs> of locks to get home, and I like that vision, you know, because uh, it, it's it's just so cutting edge that you're you're doing something about this. Um, I think Charles, he just called you a question? pirate of Mars, Mike. So. Well, I, you know, I was kind of heading Edgar Rice Burroughs or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, with your you know your eight legged thoat next to you. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, Tariq. Go ahead with your next question. Well, no, you know, I, I had one, and 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 forgive me if this is a little off topic, but you you mentioned this earlier. Um, uh, the, that, you know, here you are doing this work with MOXIE, but you're also working with the Event Horizon Telescope folks taking pictures of supermassive black holes that, you know, we'd, we'd never seen before until now. And now we're seeing a lot of them, which is great. And, uh, and, and it's like on both, on, both, on both ends of that spectrum is this, this history 
making work, things that we we never knew we could do, and here we are doing them. And I'm just curious, kind of how it feels to be part of of two very different yet very pioneering uh, space, you know, projects that are gonna that's that reverberate, you know, throughout through the mm-hmm. future. There, so yeah. no, that's where I've always wanted to be. I've, you know, I I'm not the kind of dreamer that's looking over the second hill. I'm looking over the next hill. I want to do something that no one's done before. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my career to have many opportunities to do that, and having these two at once has been, you know, just beyond believable. Um, the I, I approach them very differently because I'm really not a radio astronomer by trade. I'm really a planetary scientist. So the Mars mission, the MOXIE project, means a lot more to me, um, and uh, you know, just personally, in, in, in terms of you know, my buddies on the on the on the project. Uh, but the, the, on the other hand, the Event Horizon Telescope, because it was so new to me, because the science was so new to me, um, is, is also kind of a, you know, the first time you do something is, is unforgettable, and, and it's in that category. What I brought to that project, the reason I was really able to jump into it, is that one thing you learn, as, I've been you know, project manager of a Mars instrument and principal investigator and an instrument developer, Developers, you learn how to do projects on a large scale with, with multinational participation. So it was really my management and organizational experiences I brought to the Event Horizon Telescope more than my scientific acumen. Yeah. And I, I should point out that we've been talking for about an hour and uh, we haven't talked about how in the background of uh, Mike's office is a big sign that says, I've got Moxie, which means that A, there's Moxie swag. <laughs> And B, he really does have it, and that's the sign to prove it. So that's awesome. I just wanted to point that out to folks who can't see it. So, Thanks, Harry. If I can do a little bit of a plug, one of the biggest thrills, you know, there's a, you, you spend a lot of time and a lot of excitement developing the instrument, you know, and there are thrills along the way, and one of them was just by a chance encounter, I ended up being the Grand Marshal of the Moxie Parade in Lisbon Falls, <laughs> Maine in 2016, and that was a thrill. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, 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 that's not a coincidence. That's fate. Okay, so I've I reformulated my thinking. You're not you're not a pirate. I think uh, we're going to have to start calling you Doctor Cool, and I want to <laughs> congratulate you for being involved with some of the you know between Moxie and the Event Horizon Telescope and everything else you're doing. You are involved with some of the coolest projects of the 21st century at a time in your life when lots of us are you know casting envious glances glances at our Barco lounger. So it, it's just amazing. Is there anything else that you're you've got up your sleeve that uh, you could tell us about in the, in the future? You know, I think where I want to go next. I've thought a lot about this lately. So we, we you know, we, we've we've sent this amazing machine to Mars. I mean, I would love to follow up on it and build this full scale system. But I actually am, am eager at this point to turn my attention back to planetary science. Science. Mm. I have this amazing opportunity to be part of the Perseverance mission. And I've been totally absorbed in a technology demonstration while all this discovery has been going on around me. And I want to uh, put more of my effort into participating in that for a while um, as, as Moxie, if Moxie winds down a little bit. Well, that's fabulous. And, and the second you, you decide on the next thing that you are going to do, you need to tell us so we can have you back on. So I, I want to thank you for joining us today. Mike Hecht, the future baron of Mark Martian Oxygen. <laughs> And uh, where can people uh, follow your activities online? Uh, Well, of course, NASA maintains a Perseverance website that has all the latest and greatest from the mission. Uh, Here at Haystack Observatory, we have a website as well. And um, I think by listening to your show, I hope to be back. (laughs) Hey, well, thanks for that pitch. That's good. Tarek, where can we keep spying on you? Oh, you can always find me at space.com and uh, at Tarek J. Malik on on the Twitter. And if NASA sticks to their schedule, you'll find me back in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center waiting for Artemis 1 to fly. So let's keep our fingers crossed for that one. Well, and we should mention, of course, that that anything that that Mike does is going to show up on space.com as well. So that's a good collective site. And, of course, you can always... Uh, follow what I'm doing at pilebooks.com or at astromagazine.com or my Facebook account where I am just starting today to repost my, by the time I'm done, will be 14 articles about my little uh, Arctic trek up to the Houghton Mars Project base uh, on Facebook. So I'll be posting those um, 
day after day, sort of relive my experience because I, I miss it already. So please don't forget to drop us a line at TWIS at twit.tv. If you're of a mind to, that's TWIS at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas, always. Thanks for joining us for this discussion with Mike Hecht. It's been fun, and as always, if you have anything to say about it, do drop that email. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so be sure to subscribe and tell your friends and give us reviews. Give us five stars or 18 thumbs up or whatever the method your, <laughs> your podcatcher uses. Um, and we expect top ratings. And you can also head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. And you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. Tech, do it all. We're that interesting. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. <laughs>